Good day, everyone. Welcome to Ready, Set, Go, a webinar series sponsored by HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, also known as SNAPS. My name is Tony Gallo. I work at ICF International, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. The Ready, Set, Go webinar series, and this is set for those of you who don't know, is an acronym which stands for SNAPS eLearning Tuesdays, will be held most Tuesdays at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. This Ready, Set, Go webinar series provides valuable information and insights for continuums of care, HMIS administrators, grantees, project sponsors, and other stakeholders on a variety of topics focused on community planning and capacity building. So on behalf of SNAPS, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Today's webinar is called Reporting Housing Inventory Count and Point-in-Time Count Data in the Homelessness Data Exchange, more commonly known as HDX. And we are lucky to have the following national experts presenting today. We'll start with William Snow, who is from HUD headquarters, and Tracy Dialano, Molly McEvely, and Lauren Dunton from Math Associates. And also, we are lucky to have with us a resource advisor who will be fielding some of your questions today, Louise Rothschild, also from Math Associates. Next slide, please. Just some brief biographical information about the presenters. Um, Lauren Dunton is a senior analyst at Apt Associates. Um, she's a member of the HMIS technical assistance team and has been so for the past four years. And she provides point-in-time technical assistance and develops PIT count training materials. She manages the data collection process for the Homelessness Pulse Project and is also part of the data collection team for the annual Homeless Assessment Report, or AHAR. Tracy Dialano is also with APT Associates and has over 20 years' experience in developing and implementing coordinated housing and homeless service delivery systems at the public and the, public and the private level. Um, some of her areas of expertise include the administration and management of HMIS and overseeing the administration of various housing programs. And Ms. Dialano has the primary responsibility for overseeing the development, implementation, and maintenance of HUD's Homelessness Data Exchange. Molly McEvely is a senior analyst with APT, and she's been working on the next revision of the data standards and the VA HMIS integration project, the SSVS technical assistance project, and is working on the development of programming specifications for HUD reports. She's the task lead for the management of the homelessness data exchange and the HIC, or Housing Inventory Count Guidance and Training. William Snow was hired as a presidential management fellow at HUD in 2010, and since joining HUD, he's worked very closely to analyze HUD's homelessness data sources to learn how to make data systems more efficient and to use the data to help stakeholders understand the nature of homelessness, the efforts of providers to prevent and end homelessness, and gaps analysis. Um, and he is a desk officer at HUD with responsibilities over the Portland and Buffalo field offices. Louise Rothschild, our resource advisor, is a senior analyst at APT Associates, and she has more than eight years of experience providing technical assistance and support to communities and nonprofit organizations on a wide range of social policy, policy issues. Um, Ms. Rothschild works on projects at the federal and local level, conducting research through surveys, interviews, on-site, and remote data collection and is providing assistance in the areas of homelessness and housing counseling. And she's currently the National Data Collection Manager for the Annual Homeless Assessment Report to Congress, or AHAR, and works closely on HMIS issues. Next slide, please. Um, before we get started with the presentation, I would just like to make a couple of logistical announcements. Today's webinar will probably last approximately one hour, and it's being recorded. The webinar recording 
um, will be posted next week on the HUD Homelessness Resource Exchange, or HRE, at www.hudhre.info. Um, with your reminder from GoToWebinar today, you should have received an email. And in the email, the actual presentation slides should have been attached, or there would have been a link to them. And if you look in the welcome message on your chat box, you should see that the slides are also available there. Now, they will also be posted on the HRE as well. Due to the many, many people, almost a 1,000 who registered for today's webinar, everybody will remain on mute for the duration of the webcast, except for the panelists themselves. You may also notice a lag in the way slides advance for some participants. Um, we, as presenters, have we don't see the lag, but the later you sign into the webinar, the more the slides lag a little bit. So we'll try to announce what slide we're on, and you can either follow on if you don't mind the lag on your screen, or you can look at the electronic copy that has been provided to you. Next slide, please. Okay, so you may submit questions in the question box, which is on the right hand of your screen in the GoToWebinar navigation bar. Um, your questions are very important to us. And Louise, who is the resource advisor extraordinaire, will get to them as quickly as she can. She will also remain on the line for a little while after the end of the webinar. So if you want to get your questions answered and you submit them toward the last few minutes of the webinar, you might want to stay online because she promises she will answer your questions and your answer will pop up on your chat box. Um, if, in fact, you do not want to wait or you have questions after the broadcast, you can always submit questions through the HUD HRE virtual help desk. Just make sure when you submit your question, you choose HDX from the program system dropdown. Next slide, please. So once again, you'll be removed on mute through, throughout the call. You can submit any questions or concerns about technical matters that you have via the GoToWebinar questions dialog box on your screen. And again, materials referenced during this webinar will be available on the HUD HRE in the Learning Center within one week of this presentation. And now I'd like to uh, turn the presentation over to William Snow. Thank you, Tony want to welcome you all onto the webinar today. It's a pleasure to be with you. I always look forward to our discussions about the housing inventory and the point in time count. Um, the contents of today's webinar are very important. Um, as you've seen, we've done the housing inventory and the point in time count uh, annually. And the point in time count, obviously, we up the ante on this, uh, the shelter count starting in 2012, and we're excited about that. Um, the HIC and the PIT are forms of, of data that we use as a critical benchmark for the status of homelessness across the nation. Uh, the information that results from this process is significant for many purposes. Uh, we use it to inform the federal budget pro process, and it you know, trickles down to the local levels where you do your gas analysis and you determine what needs there are in your communities and how best to serve your people. Um, it, fantastic to see how much this data can be used, again, from federal national processes down to the local level. Um, we thank you again for your hard work and your diligence, and we appreciate your time on the call. Uh, there are a few acronyms that we're going to use over and over, and I imagine you have heard them several times, but I did want to just at least state for the record what they are, what the full um, terms are before we jump into these and, and hit you over the head with them. Um, first is HIC, stands for Housing Inventory Count. PIT stands for Point in Time, referring to the population and subpopulation persons count. COC stands for Continuum of Care. And HDX refers to the Homelessness Data Exchange. So for today, there are three core learning objectives. 
Uh, first, that you will understand the process for entering your HIC and PIT count data into HDX. Second, that you'll be able to accurately enter your HIC and PIT data by the final deadline. And third, that you will be familiar with available HDX reports that could be used to assist with the planning and policy development. Next slide, please. Uh, this webinar will flow as follows. We'll first review the HDX registration and login process. Next, we'll uh, go over the entering and submitting of HIC data. And after that, we'll review entering and submitting your PIT count data. And finally, we'll discuss how to use PIT and HIC data in the community. Next slide, please. Before we jump into nuts and bolts of entering, submitting, and using your data, I wanted to highlight a few reminders. Um, the HIC and PIT data must be submitted to HUD via the HDX. Uh, COCs can start entering as of yesterday, April 2nd. Um, the HIC and PIT data must be submitted no later than Friday, April 30th, 2012. Uh, please note that clicking the Submit button only for either the HIC or the PIT will not submit it for both. You'll actually have to submit a record for the HIC and a separate submission for the PIT. So please remember to do that. You can go to the reporting status page for both the HIC and the PIT and click on the Submit button for each data set. Thank you again for being here, and now I'll turn the time over to Tracy. Next slide, please. Thanks, William, and good afternoon to all of you. So the very first part of the training is just going to cover how you register and log into HDX, and we'll go over a couple of key points to make sure that you're able to meet the deadline for submitting both your HIC and your PIT. So next slide, please. And the very first thing that we're going to talk about is making sure that if you have had a change recently in your COC primary contact, that you submit a request to get the primary contact person updated. The COC primary contact is really ultimately responsible for ensuring that the folks who need to have access to HDX uh, have been authorized to do that. And so if your COC primary contact is changed, they won't have access to provide that access. So simply, um, if, if you need to change your primary contact, just go down to the HUD HRE virtual help desk. And uh, the, the, the good news is, is once you've submitted a request for a change in primary contact, it will change your COC primary contact, not just for HDX, but for the HUD HRE, the COC checkup process, and eSNAPS too. On the virtual help desk, choose HDX from the Program Systems drop-down menu, and then choose Accessing Changing Primary Contact from the Topics drop-down menu. The system will allow you to upload a PDF of a written request, and you'll need to do that. And the written request should be on, on your letterhead and should contain the following information, the name of the former COC primary contact, the name of the new primary contact, your continuum of care name, and your continuum of care number. Make sure to include the new person's contact information, including their phone, their position, their email address, and mailing address. And also let us know the reason for why the primary contact is changing. And make sure you've signed the, the PDF letter by an authorized person. Next slide, please. Okay, so now you've got your COC primary contact all lined up. They're ready to go. What do you need to do to access the HDX? Really, pretty simply, there's only three things you need to do. The first thing you need to do is create an account, assign rights, and log in. So accounts are created at hmis.info, and the username and password are the same for both hmis.info and HDX. The COC primary contact manages user access to HDX and assigns all kinds of different levels of access to each module. Please note, if you already have an account at HDX.info, um, you don't need to recreate a new one. And then once you've created an account and the COC primary has granted you access rights, you can log in. So let's go to the next slide, please. So where do I go to create this account? 
So the first good news is at the very end of the presentation, there will be a list of downloadable resources. And there is a resource guidance document on there that can walk you step by step through how you access the HDX and how you enter data. So today we're just giving you this broad overview. But you go to HMIS.info to create the account. And your user accounts must be created for both the primary COC contact and any individuals who will be entering data into the HDX. Next slide, please. So as a COC primary contact, if you're new to this, you're probably going, OK, well, how do I add people? How do I give them rights? Um, the first thing that you'll need to do is to um, go to the HDX admin tab. And you can see from the picture here, it's that highlighted button on the top. Only the COC primary contact will be able to see that button. And before um, any data can be entered into the HDX, the COC primary contact will need to identify user rights that are relevant, relevant to each module. And your COC may decide that they want multiple people involved with entering, reviewing, and submitting data. You can enter um, in as many people as you need to. Uh, click on the HDX admin tab to add the users. And then if you click on the little add user button at the very bottom on the right there, it's highlighted in red. That will bring up a form. So if we could go to the next slide. And this is what the form will look like. And the COC primary contact really only needs to know three things. They need to know the email address of the user who they're going to be entering, their first name, and their last name. So just enter that and save. And don't panic. If the uh, user has not yet created an account, a pop-up will appear, and it will alert you that it was unable to find an account for that email address. All you'll need to do is contact the users, tell them that they need to go back to HMIS.info and create their account. And once they've created their account, they'll be able to go ahead and log in. So let's go to the next slide. So there are three access levels for each module. And the COC primary has the responsibility for who can and cannot submit data. The first level of access is read access only. And what that provides someone is the ability to see all the data that's been entered and also to run reports so they can print reports out of the system. They just can't enter or edit data. The second level is write access. And it's important to note here that the person who has write access also has read access. They can enter data, they can edit data, but they cannot submit data. So if you can't see the submit button, button on the reporting status page, it means you don't have submit authority. Don't wait until the very last day that your data is due to realize that you don't have the ability to submit data. Check, make sure you either have submit data rights or that you know who does have submit data rights so that you can get a hold of them and let them know that they're going to need to submit the data once it's been approved. And the last white right is submit. And that individual has read access, they have write access, and they also have the authority to approve and submit data to HUD. Let's go to the next slide. So here's how the COC primary assigns rights to different individuals. For each module, you can assign an individual with the right to submit or write data for the HIC, and you can change that and make it a different individual for the point in time count or for the AHAR or for the pulse, and simply click on the button to give those individuals read, write, or submit authority. Please note that only one person has submit authority for each module. And it doesn't have to be the same person, but only one person will have submit authority. The other thing to note on this particular uh, module is you see the little thing at the very end that says remove. Some of you have gotten a long, long list of people and who have probably changed and are no longer working for the COC or working with the COC. So make sure as the COC primary that when you go in there that you remove folks who no longer should have access or authority or rights to HDX. 
So let's just go to the next slide. And if this is the HDX dashboard, once you've logged in, the system will automatically take you to this page. And the dashboard shows four boxes for each of the four reporting modules available in the HDX. The HDX dashboard organizes all reporting categories into summaries on a single screen. You can click the View Hit or the View Pit link, which will take you to the main page for each module the same way that if you were using the navigation bar up top. Each box shows the status of data so communities can more easily track their data entry pro progress. Some important features to note is each module will show you when your report is due. It will give you a very short summary of aggregate information for your point in time and your housing in inventory count numbers. It will tell you the date the data was most recently updated and who updated it. It will give you an overall utilization rate for your HIC, and it shows the status of your data. So we're going to go ahead and move to the next slide, and Molly is going to cover how to enter information into the housing inventory count. Thank you, Tracy. So as you can see from the title on this slide, I am going to be talking about entering and submitting HIC data. Um, if you have questions about HIC data collection, there is extensive guidance available on HUD's uh, Homelessness Resource Exchange website at hudhre.info. And we have slides at the end of this presentation that include links to those resources. Next slide. So before we get into the details of entering the HIC data, I'd like to talk a little bit about the structure of uh, the HIC module in the HDX, which is based on the structure of the program descriptor data elements in the HSMIS data standards, uh, which is in turn, uh, hopefully, based on the real world in which um, you have organizations, and organizations have programs, and programs have that end unit inventory. So uh, as you can see in this slide, the relationship between organizations, programs, and uh, bed and unit inventory is hierarchical. An organization has a program or programs, and programs have bed and unit inventory records. Um, as far as the HDX is concerned, an organization has just one characteristic, and that is its name. Um, so in order to appear on the HIC, an organization uh, must have at least one program. You wouldn't have a row with just an organization name and nothing else. Uh, program records belong to an organization record. And the records describe the characteristics of the program, including the program name, the program type, the geocode, target populations. Um, and just as one program can have only one name, it also has only one program type, only one geocode, and so on. Um, and just as an organization has to have at least one program in order to appear on the HIC, a program has to have at least one inventory record in order to appear on the HIC. Um, and as we'll see, a, a program might actually have several inventory records depending on um, its structure and circumstances. And then at the bottom there, inventory records belong to a program, and they describe a number of characteristics about a particular set of data and unit inventory, um, including the number of beds, the number of units, uh, the types of households served in that inventory, um, and a point in time count for the specific inventory. So that's the, that is the overview of the structure of the HIC data. Um, and next slide, we are going to talk about the, an overview of the data submission process. Um, it's got three basic components. There are a number of steps involved, but the first component is setting the date. Um, before you begin to enter HIC data, you must set a date for your HIC. Um, 
the next major component, which is covered in steps uh, two, three, four, and five, is entering your 2012 housing inventory data. And then the final step is submitting that data to HUD. Um, step two here is um, duplicate the previous year's HIC or upload HIC data from HMIS. And if we go to the next slide, um, we may be missing a slide. Could you try the next slide? Oh, no. Nope. Go backwards. OK. So um, you are going to enter and submit your HIC data using the HIC module in the HDX. So once you've logged into the HDX, along that top navigation row, you will click HIC, which is highlighted there in red. And then you'll see a secondary navigation row in gray. And that gray row is how you navigate between the various tabs of the HIC module. Um, you have the Organizations and Programs tab, which um, I know it's very mysterious, but um, what you do there is manage your organizations and programs. Uh, then you have the inventory list, and the inventory list gives you an overview of all of your inventory. It's very much like the old um, eHIC. Uh, inventory details gives you the opportunity to manage the inventory records for a program. Uh, unmet need, you record your unmet need details. On the reporting status tab, um, this is where you go to submit your HIC data, um, to access report summaries, and also to see validation errors and warnings if you have entered data that the HDX considers suspicious um, or possibly wrong. It will let you know uh, where that is and give you the opportunity to correct it. And then finally, the import data tab is where you go to upload uh, HIC data that may have been exported from your HMIS or to duplicate uh, the HIC data from 2011 as a starting point for your 2012 HIC. Next slide. And we should be on slide 22 at this point, which is what I see on my screen. Um, so duplicating your previous year's housing inventory count can be an amazing time saver. There is a lot of data and a lot of detail involved in a housing inventory count. And a lot of it is going to be very similar to the information that you submitted last year. So rather than re-entering all of your organization's programs and inventory, you have the opportunity uh, and the option to just duplicate the 2011 data uh, for 2012. This is a head start for your 2012 HIC. It isn't, um, you can't just duplicate the previous year and then um, and hit submit. For one thing, you will have to enter a point in time count for each one of your inventory records. And then for another, there is a change this year uh, in how we're tracking inventory and the household type space the inventory serves. So um, last year's data will not have information about inventory related to households with only children. So if you have um, inventory for households with only children, you'll have to go in and fix the records for those programs uh, in your 2012 HIC if you duplicate it from 2011. So to duplicate the previous year's HIC um, along that top, the gray navigation row, um, on the main page you will see the import data tab. And on the import data tab, uh, you'll see duplicate previous year. And 
So in order to duplicate the previous year's data, first you're going to enter the date for this year's HIC and click Copy Previous Year. Um, this will fully populate your 2012 HIC with your last year's data. Um, and then you can begin editing. And next slide. The other option, um, aside from duplicating the previous year's HIC data, you can, if your HMIS can export program descriptor data in CSV format, you can upload it to the HDX. Um, you still, again, have to enter pit count data for all of the inventory records. And um, the HMIS CSV structure does not include information about inventory reserved for households with only children. So again, you'd have to go in and specify that household type for the inventory to which it applies. But it is an excellent starting point for your 2012 HIC if your HMIS can export data in the CSV format. Um, to do this in the HDX, again, from the Import Data tab, click on the Upload CSV files, uh, as is highlighted in red on the screenshot. You enter the date of your housing inventory count, and then you click Choose File next to each one of those uh, file types. There's a site information file, an agency program file, and a bed inventory file. Uh, if you click Choose File, you will specify where on your computer or network the appropriate file is. When you've selected all of them, you click Upload, and that will populate your HIC. Um, one cautionary note, um, you can duplicate data from the previous year, or you can upload CSV. You can't do both. If you duplicate data from the previous year, it will wipe out whatever is on this year's HIC, and if you upload CSV, you will wipe out whatever is on this year's HIC. So this is a starting point. Once you've edited anything that you've either duplicated or uploaded, you will lose it if you go through either one of these processes again. Um, next slide. So the first two components of the HIC data, organizations and programs, you manage, add, and edit them on the Organizations and Programs tab. Um, you have a number of options on this tab. You can specify an organization view. If you, if you select the radio button next to Organization View uh, versus Program View, you will look only at a list of unique organization names on your HIC, and you won't see the program names. If you click on Program View, you will see, um, in addition to the organization name, the program names. You can sort this list by clicking, if you click on the title organization name in the header of that table, it will sort your list by organization name alphabetically. If you click on program name, it will sort your list by program name alphabetically. Uh, you can search in that white box with name ID directly above it if you enter a part of an organization name or a program name and click search. It will limit your list to uh, organizations or programs that have that text string in their names. You can filter your inventory by status, whether it's active or closed. And you can look at previous years, current years from this tab. If you click on an organization name, um, you will end up editing the organization name. If you click on the program name, you will end up editing the program record. Um, to add a new program on this tab, on the Organizations and Programs tab, you're going to click the blue button off to the right-hand side at the top of the table there that says Add Organization or Program. Next slide. It 
And if so, we can go on to the next slide. And that will give you access to a form where you can enter your program, your organization name, your program name, the program status, the type, the geocode, the target populations, whether or not it's HUD McKinney Vento funded, and any notes that may uh, be of interest to HUD. And if you have information that would help HUD to understand the nature of your program, you can enter that here. Notes are uh, totally optional, however. A program status is related to whether or not it will appear on your HIC for this year. If you set a program status to active, the program will be included on the 2012 HIC. If the program status is closed, it will not be included on the 2012 HIC. Um, so once you have entered all of your program information, you click Save, and that will create a record. Um, on that Organizations and Programs tab that we were looking at before, if you were to click on a program name and to edit the program, it would bring up a form that looks just about exactly like this and you have the opportunity to change anything that you need to change and click Save. Um, the only, there's, there's no real difference in the form to add a new program or to edit an existing program. So we can go on to the next slide, which will be slide 27. Um, the inventory list page uh, provides a complete list of your inventory as it has been entered so far. Um, on this page, you can, uh, very similar to the Organizations and Programs tab, you can sort by the various column headers. If you click on an organization name, it'll sort your whole list by organization. If you click on a program tab, the header that says program type, it will sort your whole list by program type. Um, there is a lot of data. This is a very wide page, and it doesn't fit well in um, a lot of web browsers. If you would like to um, filter which columns you see and uh, look at a subset of your columns, you can do that on this page by clicking on the Choose Columns link, which is uh, just to the date, just to the right of the um, date of the housing inventory count. You have the option to change the date of the count if you need to, to edit it. If you click on the Choose Columns link, it will bring up a little dialog box in which you can select which of these columns you want to see. And uh, sometimes it makes it uh, just a little more manageable as you're as you're looking at your inventory list. Um, you can also um, search your inventory in the same way that you can search the organizations and, pro and programs page. You enter uh, all or part of an organization or program name in the search box and click search inventory and it will filter the list to um, only organizations and programs which have that search string in their name. Uh, you can filter by year and you can filter by program type from this page. Um, from this page you can also export your HIC data to Excel um, if you would like to export it for uh, your own use in, for other purposes. You can do that by clicking on the Export to Excel button up in the, on the top right-hand side there. Uh, next slide. So the, the first step in your housing inventory count is specifying the date of the count. Um, you can do this in the HIC module. You will um, just use the calendar control there 
to pick the date of your housing inventory count and hit save. That will set your housing inventory count date for all of the tabs in the HIC module. You can change it, um, as we saw in the previous slide, you can change it from the inventory list if you need to. Uh, next slide. Then the inventory details tab gives you the opportunity to manage inventory records for your programs, which belong to organizations. And this is really where the real work of the HIC happens. You um, will, you're also able to edit existing programs uh, and inventory records from this page. Uh, if you look on the top left side of this slide, you will see that there are two drop-down boxes, one for organization and one for program. So if you want to look at program characteristics and inventory details for a particular program, first you would select the organization, and then you would select the name of the program. You will then be able to see the program type, and that that will be pulled in from the program record that you created and the various program inventory records. Um, and you enter the information here. You edit it here. This is the management page. Um, and it all gets transferred back to that inventory list. So you do something. You click the Save button in the bottom right-hand corner of the page. And then when you go back to your inventory list, you will see your changes reflected. Uh, next page. So um, as I said before, just as a program can have only one name, it can have only one program type, one geocode, one target population A, one target population B. Um, and if any of the beds are in a, pro in a program are funded by McKinney-Vento, the answer for the whole program to the question, HUD McKinney-Vento funded, is yes. So in 2011, when you entered a program, um, what you saw was on what you see on the left-hand side of this slide, an organization name, a program name, status, and notes. Um, and then for every single inventory details record, you were entering a program type, a geocode, a target population A, a target population B, and uh, whether or not the inventory was HUD McKinney-Vento funded. So this has been corrected in 2012 to align with the data standards and also to streamline data entry. So there is not going to be any need to re-enter those data elements for every single inventory record. Um, this may change some things for some of you. Um, if you have what you have been considering a single program, um, but some of its beds operate as, say, an emergency shelter, and other of its beds are operating as transitional housing, and you want to indicate that in the HIC, you are going to have to create separate program records for them on the HIC because you can't have a single program of type emergency shelter and of type transitional housing. So you'll have your first program with the inventory that operates as emergency shelter, and then your second program with the inventory that operates as transitional housing. Um, next slide. Um, another change in 2012 is that uh, bed type now applies to both emergency shelter and transitional housing. Um, the bed type options are facility-based beds, voucher beds, and other beds. Um, for emergency shelter, um, 
they are pretty much exactly what they describe. For transitional housing, um, you are going to have to distinguish between beds and units that a client must vacate when they exit the program. Uh, those are what are called facility-based beds. And beds and units that a client can continue to occupy after they exit the program, which would be um, conventional rental housing uh, leased by the client in which the program is providing a, a rental subsidy of some sort. Um, the, the latter type, uh, where the client may continue to reside in the unit after program exit, is often referred to as transition in place. And that inventory should be identified as voucher beds in 2012. Um, you can see on this slide uh, two program inventory records. One of, you can see in the inventory column, is you have a C for current. And another inventory record uh, with N for new. 80 beds of current inventory, that's inventory that was in place last year, and another record for new inventory, um, inventory that is new since the last housing inventory count. Um, and you also have the option for underdevelopment inventory. If you have beds that are fully funded as of uh, January 31st, but not yet available for use, you would enter those into your HIC but characterize them as um, under development. Uh, next slide. So in order to edit an existing inventory details record, um, you would go to the inventory details tab. You would select the organization for the program you would like to edit. Next slide. And then on slide 33, we see that you are going to choose the program you wish to edit. Next slide. This will uh, give you the opportunity to click on the row for the uh, data that you want to edit, uh, current inventory new inventory. If you click anywhere in that row, it will um, bring up below the uh, inventory details record for that inventory, and you can change uh, whatever you need to change, enter the point in time count, um, and Next slide. So um, if you import, or you, can, you can also add a new program from this page by clicking on um, Add New Program. If you, if you select an organization and then you open up the drop-down list to look for a program and you don't, don't see the program that you need to edit inventory for, you can click Add New Program and add it right there. Um, if you need to add inventory for an existing program, you can see that our, our little red highlight box uh, got joggled around a little bit, but the, um, the way to do that is to click the blue Add Inventory button off to the right-hand side uh, directly under the red box. Um, and you, you, if you had a program, um, this program here had uh, four beds in 2011, let's say, and I have duplicated last year's uh, housing inventory count for 2012. Um, and in the intervening year, my program has added new beds. So I have the four beds from last year, which are current inventory, and in order to identify um, the new beds that I have this year, click on Add an Inventory and add a new record with an inventory type of uh, new. 
and enter the number of beds, uh, point in time count, et cetera, for the new inventory. And the next year, when they're no longer new, we will merge that additional record into the current inventory record. So um, next slide. One characteristic of each inventory details record is a point in time count. So for each group of inventory, uh, you have to identify how many people were in the units and beds that you are listing on that inventory details record. Um, and before you can enter the number of people, you have to identify the date on which you counted. Now this date, the date of the pit, should be the date of the HIC. Um, so you are going to have to specify the date of your point in time count before you can enter a pin, pit count for each inventory details record. And to do that, you click set date um, at, the, at the bottom there. Um, the number of emergency shelter, transitional housing, and uh, safe haven beds you know, the number of people in those beds on the HIC must equal the total number of sheltered people on the point in time count. Um, so be careful of that. Um, next slide, please. The unmet need page is very straightforward. You enter your unmet need estimates and click Save. Um, again, there are links to resources about unmet need and other HIC topics at the end of this presentation. And I apologize, I noticed that we are, we are going to run over. Um, so I will try to go through the next couple of slides very quickly. Um, next slide, please. So the final step is to submit your data. Uh, you do that on the uh, reporting status tab. Um, this tab gives you the opportunity to submit data if it's ready to go by clicking blue submit button. You can see uh, who did the last update, who, who submitted it, if it's already been submitted, and whether or not you have any validation errors or warnings. An error must be resolved before submission. Um, Warnings are potential data quality issues that require an explanation before submission. For example, if you have more people identified in your pit count than you have beds, uh, for a particular inventory details record, you would simply uh, enter that, enter a note that explains why do you have more people than you have beds. Maybe it's because they were sharing beds, maybe it's they were sleeping in cribs, um, which don't get reported in the bed count. Um, but anyway, you will have to enter an explanation for warnings. And then you submit the data to HUD by clicking the Submit Data button. Um, and I apologize, Lauren, um, I'm going to turn this over to you now for the uh, point in time count information. I'm sorry this took so long. Thank you. Before Lauren gets started, um, this is Tony Gallo. I just wanted to say that the webinar will be extended approximately 10 to 15 minutes. So for those of you that are participating that could stay on, we welcome you to do so. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Lauren. Thanks, Tony. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about entering and submitting point in time count data into the HDX. Next slide, please. Okay, and we should be on slide 40. Um, the point in time count uh, is generally in the HDX is similar to past years. Nothing really new for this year, but I'll go through quickly the steps for entering your 2012 data. So to access the point in time module, you click on the blue um, toolbar on the gray uh, pit link. And then once you're in the point in time module, you should be on the white uh, PIT counts tab and then you want to click on the blue new count button to create your 2012 count and that has a red box around it on your screen. Um, every COC should be entering a point in time count this year because 
um, as William mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, every COC was required to conduct a sheltered count in 2012. So um, from uh, this, once you click on the new count screen, um, you're going to be asked uh, to enter some basic information on your point in time count. Next slide, please. The first thing that you will need to enter is you will need to choose your uh, the date that you conducted your point in time count. Um, and there's a little calendar button next to the uh, blank and a calendar will pop down and then you just click on that the date that you conducted your point in time count and it will populate in the white box. If you conducted your count outside of the last 10 days in January, when HUD requires that you conduct your point in time count, um, the question of whether you received a HUD waiver will appear under the date of the point in time box. Um, and then you would need to click yes or no. Um, don't panic if you don't see the waiver option. It's only if you conducted your count outside the last 10 days in January. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay, so the next step um, for back entering background information for your point in time count is to indicate whether or not your COC conducted a sheltered count or a sheltered and unsheltered count in 2012. So, um, I'm sorry, the arrow got moved a little bit there. It should be pointing a little bit lower to the populations in this count uh, header that's in the middle of your screen. And then you would just click on the radio button to the left of sheltered and unsheltered count or um, the sheltered only count. The, the unsheltered count only option is not available because uh, as we mentioned earlier, the 2012 count, sheltered count is required for all COCs this year. So um, once you fill that out, um, you're going to move on to actually entering your point in time count population and subpopulation data. Can you please click to the next slide? So we're now on slide 43. Um, this is where you're going to actually be entering your point in time account data. You're going to be entering the number of persons by the household type and program type that you counted in the COC on the night of your point in time. Um, these numbers are broken out by emergency shelter, transitional housing, and safe haven programs. Similar to past years, there are built-in validations, both errors and warnings in the system to ensure that uh, data is reported accurately and there are no inconsistencies. So as you enter your data, you may see little yellow pop-up boxes that present either errors or warnings about your data. You can choose to address them as you go along, or you can wait till um, the end after you've entered all your data to go back and uh, consider those errors and warnings more closely. When you're done entering your data on the households and persons in each of the three household types, persons and households with at least one adult, one child, persons and households with only children, and persons and households without children, uh, make sure to click Save. The Save buttons actually are not displayed on the screenshot because they were uh, didn't fit on the slide, but they're on the upper right and lower right corners of the screen in HDX. Next slide, please. Once you're finished entering your population count, you should click at the top of the uh, screen there to the second tab that says homeless subpopulations. You just click on that tab and then you're going to want to enter information on the homeless subpopulations. This is broken out by the chronically homeless and veteran subpopulations at the top. Remember that you're required to report on both chronically homeless individuals and chronically homeless families. Then you need to enter information on veterans and then other homeless subpopulations, which include the severely mentally ill, those with chronic substance abuse issues, persons with HIV or AIDS, victims of domestic violence, and unaccompanied children. Um, just like the populations tab, you're going to have built-in validation errors and validation warnings on this um, screen as well. You uh, can address them as you go along or wait until the end. Um, and then remember to click the Save button again. It will be located in the upper right and lower right corner. It's blue. Next slide, please. So the third tab in the module is the Notes tab. And this is where you can enter any information that you think is important uh, for HUD to know about your point-in-time count in 2012. This is also where you can enter information 
um, to explain any validation warnings that you may have um, encountered in your entering of the data. The, the more information you can provide HUD with, the better. It really helps to understand some of the nuances of the data, um, and it may save a call or an inquiry later about your data when HUD begins the data cleaning process. So we really encourage you to enter any notes or comments that you have for um, HUD's review. So when you're done entering notes, you can hit the Save button. There it is in the lower right corner on the screen. Next slide. So after you're done entering information on your populations and subpopulations and you've entered any notes, you can navigate to the Reporting Status tab. That's accessible from the, the well, white bar. It's one of the two tabs available in the Point in Time module. So once you click on the Reporting Status tab, you uh, see the screenshot to the right displays the date of your count, and it also um, has the reports available. There's a summary in both PDF and Excel that's available. It sh displays when you last updated the count, who the last update was made by, whether or not the count has been submitted. It also displays all the validation errors and validation warnings for the entire PIT module. So you can click on the little plus signs to the right of the error and warnings and then a drop down will come, the page will expand and you can see individually where the errors and warnings are. And then there's a link that you can click on to say fix and it'll navigate you back to where you need to make any changes or maybe explain your data more thoroughly. You also at the bottom can click on the messages link and that will um, connect you to HUD's virtual help desk where you can submit any questions that you may have. So just to reiterate what Tracy and William mentioned earlier, you need to make sure to submit both your point in time module and your housing inventory module. So to submit your point in time module, you need to click on the blue submit button in the upper right corner. It has a red box around it. And as Tracy mentioned, if you don't see the submit button, it probably is because you don't have submit rights in the HDX. So you would need to circle back to your COC primary contact to gain access. Um, either for them to give you access to submit or to identify the right person to submit the data. So that's pretty much everything about the point in time data entry process. And I'm going to turn it back over to Tracy to talk about next steps. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Hey, guys, we're almost done. Just a couple more slides and we're there. So one of the things we wanted to just let you know is there are a lot of really good reports that you can now pull off of HDX. Now that we're in our third year of data collection and in fact we've pre-populated some of your point in time information and previous tick information, you can pull reports from all the years that you have data entered into HDX. So you can pull HIC reports up, PIT reports up. Um, AHAR, Pulse, and probably the newest feature is the COC profile report, which really does an analysis over time of your HIC data, your PIT data, and if you're participating in AHAR or Pulse, that, that information. So use HDF to help you define what's going on in your community, what your unmet needs are, what your gaps are, and to help inform policy decisions. So make sure that you're, you're aware of all the different types of reports that you can pull. So next slide, please. And the next two slides are literally, you can you have these now, these are links to the guidance information that you're going to need to be able to enter your information. Um, let's just go to the really quickly to the next slide. I just want to highlight one thing underneath the resources for calculating unmet need. One of the biggest issues we run into every year is everybody gets through entering all their HIC information, and for some reason they can't submit, and it's the, the reason is you haven't gone to that last tab to do your unmet need. So there's an updated resource guidance document posted there to help you walk through that process. So make sure that you do your unmet need and you access the resources for that. And I think we'll just move on to the next slide and we'll wrap her up. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much to our resource advisor, Louise Rothschild, and to our presenters, William Snow, Tracy Dialano, Molly McEvely, and Lauren Dunton for today's presentation. And thanks to all of you participants for joining us today.
If you have additional questions that you are not submitting through this webinar, through your um, Ask a Question box, please submit them through the virtual help desk. And also, please note that this webinar recording and PowerPoint presentation will be posted next week on the HRE website. Next slide, please. Again, um, Louise will be available for a few minutes after the presentation so that anybody who submitted a question while the webinar was um, going on in the last probably 10 minutes of the webinar, she can try to answer all your questions. Um, please join us on May 22nd at 3.30 p.m. Eastern for our next Ready, Set, Go webinar, which is called Building the Bridge, HPRP to ESG, which should be very, very interesting. Next slide, please. So by now, you should now be able to understand the Homelessness Data Exchange data entry workflow processes for the housing inventory count and the point in time count. Accurately enter your required hit, pick, and pit data by the final deadline. And then also be familiar with the available HDX reports that could be used by COCs to assist with planning and policy development. Um, before I bid you adieu, please take a few minutes to complete the online survey to let us know how well you felt this webinar achieved its objectives. Um, very shortly after the webinar, you should receive a link to an online survey um, through your email. And we will use this feedback to help provide um, us with information on how to improve future webinars. So with that, thank you for your patience. Thank you for staying on the line. And we wish you a good afternoon. Thank you.